Hello and welcome to Consciousness Central Special Bonus Edition Part 1. I'm your host, Nick Day, coming to you from the Science of Consciousness Conference 2016 here in Tucson. My next guest is Alan Combs. Alan is a professor of consciousness studies at the California Institute for Integral Studies in San Francisco, uh, which is an institute that is pioneering the study of consciousness in the US. Alan, welcome. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about that. Um, Let's talk about how we take uh, the um, consciousness studies and bring it into uh, education and academia. Well, Where I work, the California Institute of Integral Studies, consciousness has been uh, an important part of the picture since way before it was really recognized outside of that. In fact, I'm still amazed at how many people I talk to uh, here in the conference who have to kind of sneak around at (laughs) home uh, for fear their dean will learn that they're studying about consciousness or something like that, you know. Uh, one of my dear friends is Michael Murphy of uh, Esalen Institute, and he always says, uh, progress goes forward one funeral at a time in academia. And I think we're moving forward, lots of people dying, actually. Some of them we did really not very happy to have died recently. Uh, but uh, CIS got started way back in the 50s when Michael Murphy and some other people went to India and uh, met uh, Orobindo's partner, the mother, came back, started having evening conversations between Michael Murphy, Alan Watts, was a character, then uh, one or two professors from Stanford, uh, and the whole thing started to roll, a rocky roll as independent institutions tend to be, but gradually picked up momentum and uh, became the California Institute of Integral Studies sometime in the late 60s or 70s. Uh, with our first president, I wasn't there at the time, the first president was actually recommended, a uh, scholar recommended by Sri Aurobindo, uh, Harry Das Chowdhury, uh, who was an Indian scholar, a foremost scholar of uh, Indic studies. And he came and he was the first president and he started a tradition of uh, integral education. Uh, Now, Integral today is associated with a lot of things, often with Ken Wilber, for example, because he has a kind of what he calls integral, uh, kosher integral uh, sort of form, which is the four quadrants and all that. But uh, Harry Das Chowdhury had a very broad view. Uh, He was writing the 60s and 70s, and uh, when you read his uh, work, you get uh, psychology, you get existentialism, which was popular at the time, and, uh, of course, a lot of spiritual... uh, information in a way, uh, especially Asian. We still have pictures of Sri Aurobindo and the mother in the hallways at at CIS. Uh, So we've always been open to consciousness, uh, but consciousness studies is a kind of uh, area that people would get involved with and actually call it consciousness studies uh, is a relatively new phenomenon. So let me ask you one question here. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> when we use the word consciousness, how many definitions can I think of? Probably four or five. Yeah. What, what's your definition of consciousness? Well, you know, that brings us to the next topic, I think, mm-hmm. in some ways. Uh, in fact, I was just asked to give a talk at a conference in Berkeley in a few weeks, and uh, that's going to be partly my topic, is why can't we talk about consciousness better? <laughs> Uh, one problem is that uh, consciousness has become a noun, and it's very problematic. It's a problematic noun. It's a, you know, it's a thing you can't see, you can't weigh it, can't find it anywhere. Everybody knows what it is. It's like we were all talking about the other night, Zen and the motor, uh, Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I don't know whether you're old enough to remember that book, you know. But Just about. <laughs> very popular book in the late 60s, and uh, it's all about quality. The author is about quality, and but nobody can define it. And so there's this wonderful sentence, it's all about quality and you know what it is. Well, that's sort of the way consciousness is. We're going to talk about consciousness and you know what it is. Uh, but to define it and to make a noun out of it is really problematic. And Because once you make a noun out of it, you start looking for it. Well, maybe it's in atoms, maybe it's 
mm-hmm. you know, a wave object, pattern. Yeah. And, then uh, it becomes a separate object. It becomes a thing. You know, experience. William James is one of my great heroes, uh, right up there along Stuart Kaufman. <laughs> uh, he just threw the word out about halfway through his career. He said, I'm done with it. He says, it's a word that's a bad word, and it just gets us in big trouble. Uh, and he started using the word experience. Now, if you try to define experience, it's got as many problems or more than the word consciousness, but you can talk about it in a much easier way. You say, well, my, my wife here, is, uh, she's asleep and she's, uh, if you, she's dreaming. She's, having, she's experiencing a dream. Well, you don't have any problem with experiencing a dream. It's an easy communication. You say, well, she's in a dream state. She's in dream consciousness. Well, then you think, well, what's that mean? Is that a discrete state of consciousness? Is it a discrete brain state? Uh, is it different than other kinds of consciousness? And you get into all this business. Well, th- they're all legitimate questions, but if you just say somebody's experiencing something, uh, you know, that rolls off the tongue easily, we understand it, and it, it kind of is not as bad. <laughs> so you might say that within the general context of consciousness, we are raising consciousness. And as we raise consciousness, it seems the world becomes a better place. Well, yeah, generally so. Yeah. Because in a uh, way, there's a lot of... Unfortunately, there are some backdrafts in I, all I this. I suppose but, there is. Yeah. But I mean, one of the things you can say is that yeah. there's a lot of talk about... I mean, we can talk, 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 and you know, academia is wonderful for that. And of course, yes, we, yeah. we, you know, that takes us forward in our understanding of things. But in terms of you know, transforming the world into a place we all want to live in, that's... Things are you know, trying to move forward. I mean, yeah. there was this book a couple of years ago by uh, Steve... Uh, Pink, not Pinker, what's his name? The, the guy that worked with uh, at Harvard. It's called The Better Angels of Our Nature. Yes, okay. Uh, mm, pink, right, pink, no, okay. I'm blanking thing. on that. Yeah, but, <laughs> know uh, you know, he makes a very good, he was here actually yeah. a few years ago talking to him. Um, he makes a really good argument that uh, if you can look at the world overall, and of course we got these really hot spots right now, uh, but the things are moving forward. I mean, equal rights for, for minorities and women, slavery is disappearing, all kinds of things. There have been two or three books like this. And part of that picture, I imagine, is uh, a greater awareness of consciousness. And along with that comes uh, greater empathy in uh, synergy between people. In fact, I'm working on a paper right now that's mostly inspired by <clears throat> a consciousness researcher by the name of Christian De Quincey. He's written several books. He's a very bright fellow. Uh, and he really argues that our minds are, at the deepest level, connected. That is, relationships, and, and not through the, just the exchange of language. This yeah. is the way it's usually yeah. interpreted. But there's, there's a kind of deeper feeling strata that we actually is a primary kind of sharing, uh, a, a kind of deep subjectivity, a shared subjectivity. I find it a fascinating mm-hmm. idea. Yeah. For sure. It could be Sheldrake's morphic fields, it could be Jung's collective unconscious, it could be some kind of quantum mind. It could yes, be, definitely. Uh, any definitely. of the above, all these names we're coming up all with. But of it the does above. appear to be that way. Why are we not one single system? Deepak no. said we're all basically one thing arising as mountains, birds, fish, hippos, us. Yeah, I love Chatting Deepak. to each other. Yeah, he's going to make Vedantas yeah. out of all of us. Yeah, I, I think, think he, he works out. That's where we're going, going, isn't it? Yeah, that's great. Well, Henry, great. Stapp, Henry Stapp just now made a some parallel and similar comment, even though he's not referring to the Eastern traditions. He's sticking to the West. In his All system. these great well, scientists, once they get about 60, uh, get start to look around, <laughs> and they kind of begin to reinterpret things, yeah. you know, and the mm-hmm. spir- little spiritual bug yeah. starts coming it's in. Interesting, and isn't it's interesting, it? It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. You know, I mean, even, uh, uh, who are we just talking about? Um, the complexity guy that's here at the conference. Uh, Stuart? Yeah, Stuart Kaufman. I mean, yeah. his last book is about spirituality. He didn't yeah. define it quite the way I do, but uh, it's wonderful. I mean, spirituality for him is about the creativeness of the cosmos. That's a wonderful concept. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so I think we're seeing this all over the place. 
That sounds like a positive, upbeat moment to say thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Alan, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for coming down. That's, yeah. uh, Alan Coombs. Thank you, thank you very, very much. much. So let's join our roving reporter, Cameron Keyes. So, some more impressions from today's uh, early plenary talks. What did you guys think? Um, I really enjoyed Selin Adesoy's talk. Uh, she basically had an effort to combine oscillatory time dynamics with spatial like brain networks. And she had this really cool model of using um, Laplacian math to kind of view resting state networks as standing waves and like derived um, from the structure and shape of the brain all these brain networks that you find in functional data. And that was just really mind blowing. And uh, yeah, I came out in nature like a few months ago. So I'm like excited to go read that and cool. see how it fits with my own stuff. What do yeah. you think? Well, much less technically, I, I did enjoy De Deepak Chopra's uh, talk about uh, the new kind of science, which he called qualia science, which is a great way to frame how a, con a science of consciousness could truly develop, which is that you really systematize the qualia itself and uh, make that into a science. I thought it was quite good. And Chalmers, uh, David Chalmers' talk about uh, the ontological status of virtual reality was, um, for someone interested in philosophy like myself, uh, very enjoyable and a little less over my head than some of the more uh, specific neuroscience like he was just talking about with Laplacian networks and things, which yeah, yeah. I didn't quite follow, but uh, he did, so that's good. So <laughs> Yeah, well, there's something for everybody that's here. Right. The philosophers mm -hmm. get these clear presentations, the scientists get into the minutia of everything, but uh, so uh, thanks guys for talking, and yeah, we'll see more you. later. Thank hey, so we're here at the poster session, and we're going to find out uh, about uh, some new ideas, some fresh ideas. So we've got a couple of uh, folks here that are going to tell us uh, what they're up to. So tell us uh, what's your names, and tell us about your poster. Like. I am Shab Sahani, and I study in APJ School, Noida. I am Surat Sahani, I study in APJ School, Noida. So our poster is about the theories of universe and the concepts of space and time, similarities between modern science and ancient Indian scriptures. In the 20th century, scientists first stated the following facts. The first, that the universe had a beginning and will have an end. And second, the time and space are neither absolute nor infinite. These were stated by Einstein, Stephen Hawking, and Robert Ro Ro Roger Penrose. And uh, what I found surprising was that the ancient Indian scripture, which were composed thousands of years ago, which are different in, in a poetic form, all uh, do though they conclude that uh, they conclude the same kind of thing. The, that the, about the insane, uh, ancient story of relativity and Stephen Hawking's and Roger Penrose theories. So the modern science says, uh, according to them, the beginning of universe is 15 million years ago, known as the Big Bang, and the end of the universe is at least 20 billion years ago, as per Hawking's. The second law of the uh, Therm thermodynamics is like the amount of entropy or disorder in the universe is constantly increasing. So uh, if the universe did not have a beginning, it would be in complete disorder by now. So this is its facts. So quantum mechanics say that singularity is not possible. Does the universe bounce back? But according to the quantum theory of Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, the universe prior to the Big Bang, the universe not, does not bounce back. So the ancient Indian scriptures say that uh, that there, uh, at one side there is a universe and at the other there is an absolute, and in the middle there is a time-space causation, which is similar to the uh, the time-space causation is similar to the light cone of Hawking and Penrose. Uh, the, it, it is focused at the point, if we go back in time, uh, in assuming there is sufficient time to pull, uh, pull in the light. So in this, we are here, if we look in the past, we see the universe, because the light of the source need time to uh, come to us. So this is the light cone. So the time-space causation is also known as Maya in Indian scriptures. It is the glass through which the absolute is seen, and what is on the lower side, it appears as the universe. 
the absolute is infinite the universe it includes material heaven earth and everything uh, everything that exists what's going on 3d hi well i'm a sacred geometry artist and i create sacred geometry artwork to help people accelerate their ascension and all these shapes do affect consciousness they work by harmonic oscillation the shapes carry a certain high vibration and it excites the crystalline matrix of the water in your body to harmonically match the vibration of the shape, increasing the vibration of the person wearing it. So what do we got here? Oh man, what do you want? We got all sorts of stuff. Um, this is the snowflake of life. This is six Kabbalah trees of life connected together. This is the snowflake of life version two, which is two of them back to back. Um, I got a three-dimensional Sri Yantra. I took the Sri Yantra from a two-dimensional object and popped it out into 3D, which actually opened it up and allowed a lot more energy to flow through it. Mm. Um, let me see, I've got tantric stars, star tetrahedrons, I've got fifth-dimensional hypercubes, I've got flower of life star tetrahedrons, uh, what you want, man? I got it or I'll make it. Thank you so much. I'll take it all. My name is Titus Joseph. I'm the author of a new book on metaphysics and spirituality entitled Our Curious World of Mirror Images, Reflections on How Symmetry Frames the Universe, Empowers the Creative Process, and Provides Context to Shape Our Lives. So here we go. So in the case of positional symmetry requisite mirror image, we have mirror image poles. The poles can be, in the case of a fruit, for example, the stem, and what's called the blossom end. It could be a tree, branch, and root. It could be a planetary body, which would be North Pole, you see it points to the North here, and South Pole, et cetera, et cetera. So mirror image poles in positional symmetry, okay? And requisite mirror image ties the two together as one. So should, should, the, should the probability of one pole and another pole should they intersect in space and time, this, in, this creates a quantum entanglement processes where the two are one, circuits are generated that unite the two together as one, this process creates the new being. Now an example is, we see this exact same archetype here in a planet body, okay? So the poles are North Pole and South Pole, okay? We see the, what's called the zone of symmetry and, uh, and the gravitational field lines. What I'm arguing is that this whole system, this whole circuit is a system that with the bent space time here, it forces, it feeds space-time to the center, the space-time then co coagulates under pressure and becomes a material body like water. Deep in the heart of that water is dirt, way in the depths, things become pixelated and granular. That forms the Earth body. So this is a general outline of the same system here. We see over and over examples of this in nature. Uh, for example, there's a, uh, this is the, uh, a uh, planetary nebula and you see the same shape. Okay, uh, over here is a beautiful example. This is called the egg nebula. Okay, and we see the same uh, form right here. This is a Hubble image, it's a classic Hubble image. So, in the end, the concept is that all things come together through mirror image poles, like branch and root. What's important is the part in the middle where there's an instantaneous communication between the two, that's the part that forms reality. In the, form, in the case of a tree, branch and root forms a universe of trees. Uh, you know, we see a butterfly, the poles would be maybe uh, mind and body, or you know, tail and front, whatever. The, the, we see the zone of symmetry in the body here. You know, this here is a, a galactic web and uh, synapses in the brain. We see that they're equivalent, in, you know, in biology, form equals function. The suggestion is that the universe is conscious. My name is uh, Oded Maimon from Tel Aviv University. And uh, I've developed uh, uh, rigorous mathematics that shows the foundation of um, consciousness from a basic mathematics concept. So f instead of having four dimension for a set of two, I create the fifth dimension, which is uh, a combination of, uh, of the objects. And this fifth dimension is a, a conscious uh, dimension. Mm. So from two different ideas, you generate one, and like that you can generate from two others Another one, and eventually you have one which is the sum of all the ideas, while each one remains separate, 
they have they create also something in common. Hmm. So instead of a normal coordinate system like Cartesian coordinate system, we get a a, a Mobius strip as right. like a basic uh, you, structure. You create infinity from the finite uh, elements. Awesome. <laughs> I'd like to welcome my next guest, Tracy Brandmeier. She is a neuroscientist from the Center for National Research Science in Toulouse in France. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you Thank for you having for coming. me. Thank, Thank you for coming. You. So your field of research covers quite a lot of interesting stuff from the point of view of consciousness. We're looking at neurofeedback, meditation, mm -hmm. working with meditators, what goes mm -hmm. on in the brain when people meditate. You're measuring that or trying to understand it at some neuroscientific level. Can you give a, sure. an outline of what's going on? So we work with, um, with a group of really advanced meditation practitioners in India. And we did a series of EEG studies looking at what is happening in the brain in uh, meditators that have been practicing for a very long time. And there's a lot of people doing research on meditation and what's happening in the brain in terms of EEG. But what we were really interested in and what were some of the more stable EEG components that were similar across subjects and what changed um, after people practiced for a long period of time. So we took people who were quite novice and then we compared them with people who were really experienced and we looked to see what was there anything that was similar, was there anything that was different and what we found was that in all of our practitioners there was a set of regions in the brain called the um, namely the mid-cingulate cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex which seem to light up during meditation. And this is uh, interesting because these parts of the brain are very well studied in terms of the attention literature. So we know that in meditation, we really are training this ability to gain better control over where we put our attention. And from those findings, we've then developed a series of neurofeedback protocols to see if we can actually train these types of components in, in normal people and clinical populations as well. Why would somebody want to do meditation? <laughs> well, I think, I think generally speaking, we're kind of, at, at this point, point in time, I think we're quite overwhelmed. I think everyone kind of realizes intuitively that you want to be present, and you kind of want to be able to direct your attention more efficiently. I don't think there's something wrong necessarily with this ability to mind wander and this ability that we have to kind of go somewhere else when we're in a really boring environment. But I think we would like to sense that we had a little bit more control over it. And, and so I think that's why there's all this interest in meditation technology. And I think that's kind of what compels a lot of people to meditate, that, that you kind of feel better when, when you can kind of just be here and not and not have to, you know, struggle with, 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 you know, 50 other things that are pulling your attention elsewhere. So these, um, you're, you're working with long-term meditators who mm -hmm. are, what, Tibetan Buddhist monks, this kind of thing? This particular group of um, meditators are from the Himalayan meditation tradition. There was a, uh, a tradition that's very old uh, of, of monks that lived up in the Himalayas. They're not, uh, they're not necessarily connected to the Tibetan tradition but the practices they do are, are, are fundamentally quite similar. It does seem, <clears throat> in our culture at least, is that if um, something like meditation, for it to really gain, um, uh, shall we say, um, cultural approval, uh, a science has to say, yeah, it works, it's okay, it's not just some Eastern thing, you know, it's a good idea, do it, because the scientists said so. And it's we definitely go, yeah, sci the paradise. Scientists said so, <laughs> yeah. I know that's it, I'm going to buy the box and I'll you know, yeah. plug in and away we go. You yeah. know, so that seems to be our, very much our culture, it's a very sort of Newtonian thing, isn't it? We say do cause and effect, we do that, we get that. Yeah. So um, maybe you're Absolutely. part of sort of melting some of that re resistance away and bringing this whole new, you know, well, it's not new at all, but uh, techniques to people who would otherwise never even consider it. I do think that's kind of the, I would say, the, the beautiful thing about, about what we're doing is that there are a lot of people, for, for whatever reasons, are, you know, a little bit hesitant to, just the word meditation in itself kind of creeps, freaks them out. They're like, I could never sit and meditate, or, you know, for whatever religious purposes, you know, they find it, you know, against their own personal values. Um, 
So, so yeah, I, I think the applications of, of, of these practices and, and, and turning them into a, a form of technology that, that could reach more people that would be open to that versus, you know, a more formal practice. Um, yeah, this is, this, is, this, is, this is the future. Would you, um, do you think there's a connect, or how close is the connection, or how would you quantify the differences or similarities between meditation and hypnosis? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, I actually don't have much uh, experience with hypnosis. Um, intuitively, I would say that I think hypnosis is really, from what I understand, a really engaging kind of the sub subconscious, whatever that is. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and meditation, I would say, actually is similar. You are, you are tapping into the subconscious, but I'm actually not completely clear on what your, what your question was. Maybe you can repeat. Well, I suppose, um, you know, hip when, 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 you're, when you're hypnotized, mm -hmm. and I trained in hypnosis, so right. I've worked with people, not a lot, but some people, and you place them into a very relaxed state where mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. a certain lot of cognitive activity goes quiet, mm -hmm. if you like, mm -hmm. and they feel very relaxed, and during that period they can be quite suggestible, mm -hmm. and when they come out of it, generally it's a very nice experience, and it seems as if that's kind of what happens with meditation. I don't know about the suggestibility, but certainly the sense of calming things down mm -hmm. and entering a state which is somewhat different. Yeah. So I sort of I mean, wonder if, yeah, we, I mean, I know it, the word meditation and the word hypnosis are labels to describe something that... Some kind you know, of altered part, state of consciousness. Yeah, an altered state. Yeah, I mean, just, just the first thing that pops into my mind in terms of differences would be that uh, I think with meditation, you're, one of the things that's, that's unique about meditation that you don't have with hypnosis or, say, psychedelics either is that you're very lucid. You know, I think that's one of the the the, the, the reasons why meditation is, is very attractive is because you 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 really kind of in, I don't want to say in control because we're not in control, but <laughs> but you are, are lucid and you're you're very aware of what you're doing and you're not you know you're not I don't I, I have never been hypnotized, but I would guess you know you're uh, allegedly you're not really aware that you're being suggestible and and in this particular state. So I think with meditation. You know, there's a very active. You're very involved in the process. It's 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 you're, it's like doing psychoanalysis on yourself, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're really engaging deeper levels of the mind. And when you when you do go deep into retreat into these long uh, courses, things surface, memories that I you know that I didn't even remember having. You know, from my childhood, kind of walking back in time. It, it's it's really interesting to to realize that all this information is there. We're, we're being bombarded with information constantly, and we know the neuroscience has shown that that information, it sticks. You know, my super, Simon Thorpe, the supervisor of my lab, did a really brilliant study, and they, they presented a bunch of really images very fast below the conscious threshold. 25 years later, they measured those same people, and they had altered brain responses to the images that they had been shown 25 years before. Wow. So we know that we're wow. neurally mm -hmm. kind of storing these um, impressions of, of the physical material world uh, in our brain, and and so so it's all in there. <laughs> and interestingly, the bat cave. <laughs> yeah, interestingly, <laughs> hypnosis. There are there are there are certain uh, clinical um, uh, hypnotic techniques that mm. do the same thing with people. They do some kind of right. regression, and you can take you back to you know so many years ago, perhaps your childhood, mm. and they can sort of fix things that happened you know, sort of get in there yes. and kind of reframe experiences so people then have a different relationship to that experience. They yeah, this is really, I think... trauma to some degree. So it's is, interesting. Yeah. I think there's a lot of parallels there, very interesting. It's interesting. You're reminding me, uh, Stephen LaBerge is here, and he's oh, yes. such a cool guy. Yes. And, and he does, of course, all the lucid dreaming research. And, and, and I think lucid dreaming actually is very similar in that sense. Yeah. People can really go into their dream world, and once you learn to gain control over over your dreams, you can really work through some clinical, some, some issues. And, yeah. and, and, and he has some really beautiful data. I've actually looked at some of his data, and, and, and it's impressive what, what, he's, what he's done. We talked to Rudy Tanzi, Rudolf mm -hmm. Tanzi, and he, go, he, does, he has a lucid dream practice. He, oh, does he? Okay. He dreams twice a week. Mm. And in his dreams, he uh, composes music at the piano. Mm. And he's a great piano player. Great I piano heard player. him last night. Yeah. <laughs> and he also um, solves some of um, sort of gene expression problems. 
he goes in and he taps in. Of course, he has, he has naturally, a right? Of course. <laughs> of course he does. But the fabulous <laughs> thing is that what, what's sort of amazing is he goes in and he has a certain, it's quite sort of interesting he describes it, mm. what he does, he sort of gets this down, download, whatever, and then he has to yeah. go to the lab and check it to see if it's for real. And then it, when it is What do you for mean real, he has the download? Well, he has some kind of, he has a ritual in the dream, in the lucid oh, dream. Oh, where he actually kind of where documents. Where he sort of calls it in somehow. I mean, where sure. do you go for it? And then he gets the knowledge, wakes up with it, presumably sort of writes it down or somehow records it. Yeah, this is an off to the lab, clearly an advanced and they lucid run, dreamer. I know, and he runs the numbers <laughs> and they go, well, nice one, Rudy, you just discovered a whole new one. So what... Which yeah, raises this the is question, brilliant, right? this what's, is what's going on there? What is going, what is that? Well, I mean, this, amazing, is, this is interesting, right? Because a lot of people would say that this, I mean, and, and I, I would agree that the subconscious mind is actually a much more sophisticated uh, system than the conscious mind. Uh, it has access to much more information. So, so this is great, right? I mean, this would, this would make sense that, that if you can actually gain some kind of mastery of your dreams where you can access your conscious, subconscious mind and solve, you know, gene expression problems. problems then, then, <laughs> it's just waiting there. Then, to, to uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, the snake eating its tail, you know. Yeah, so. Ouroboros. Okay, and with that, Tracy, thank you so much for thank talking you, to us Nick. this afternoon. That was great, Absolutely. very interesting, and thank good luck you. with everything, and you're about yes. to get your PhD very, very soon. Congratulations on that. Thank you so much. All right, thanks again. That's Tracy Brown Meyer. <laughs> I'm Jam Kachar. My Stan name is Ju Maruda. I'm from Stanford. He's from Brain Trauma Foundation. And we're very interested in how people pay attention. And we equate attention and consciousness together. And so one thing you have to do to pay attention, because the brain takes time to process information, you actually have to be ahead, predict, called the predictive brain state. So if you want to see a ball playing tennis, you have to swing at it before it gets there. So we're measuring this with eye tracking. We, we uh, have a dot going around a circle, and we have cameras in your eyes, and we can see where your eye is positioned. So here's somebody with a concussion, and what happens in concussion is they jump forward into the future, because your brain has a plan what's paying attention, but it holds it back to you in real time. And so what we're seeing is some people have really good attention. They have good eye tracking, and their, eye, and their information lands on their fovea, in the back of their eye, just right. So they're focusing, and the blue is focusing all the time. They have some people that are not that good, and they're focusing some of the time. And here's a person who's really bad. So we'd say this person has really good attention, and therefore is conscious most of the time of real things happening. These two people, less so. They're making up of the in-between. So they're, they're paying attention, and they're not, they're not, they're not. And in between, they have to fill in. So they're making up a separate reality. So this person's probably seeing reality as it really is, and this person's filling in the gaps. I am Rohit Srivastava from Agra, DEI Agra. And uh, what we have done is, we have taken two sets of silver coins, uh, and they were divided into two sets. One was called controlled, and the other one was experimental. And then these were placed, the experimental one was placed in a spiritually charged environment in a prayer hall where thousands of people sit in the morning and in the evening and they do the prayer. Yeah. And the other set was in a controlled conditions in a laboratory. And then after that, we after five days exposure, we recorded the Kirlian images. Uh, and Kirlian photography? Yeah, yeah, Kirlian okay. photography. The aura of the images. And then by comparing the image pattern of the control set versus the experimental set, we found that there is some change in the image pattern. We calculated two parameters. The first one is brightness of the image, and the other one is entropy. And you see, these are the changes. We have gone for three types of measurements, one by 10 second camera exposure, one second camera exposure, and 10 second camera exposure. And we have found this. These are the values for experimental. This is for CNT, uh, that is control set. This is the mean value. These are the standard deviation value. And you can see, there is a maximum difference that we have found is for 10 second exposure. These are the brightness values. These are the entropy values. So there is a distinct variation that is there, that is clear. But how it is connected with the consciousness, that is something which we have to still work on and explore. Okay, so you found an effect, but yes. uh, more work needs to be done to yeah, explain yeah, the effect. Definitely, definitely. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sayed from UMass Amherst. Uh, this is a picture which shows that I want to convey this message that 
there is a unity between subject and object. So uh, out of this unification, uh, both the subject and the objects comes out. So uh, my proposal is that in the direct observation, uh, there are three stages out of some unification between subject and object. The first stage is C stage, just pure perception without concept. Then the C as stage, which concepts come to the play. And then I C as the stage. When, and the total is that, first of all, there is a unity between subject and object. Then some disunity happens, some decoherence happens. And then, because of some redundant data and over complete basis, there is a chance to reunification. And this re reunification, according to my thesis, is the ground for emergence of introspection. Okay. And uh, I see that you've got some mathematical formalisms here. Is that where all the meat and potatoes of the work? <laughs> yeah. First of all, there is an entangled state between the mental state of the observer and the states of the observed. And then, because of some uh, orthogonal basis in the, in the cognitive visual cortex, my proposal is that some decoherence happens. And then, uh, because this is the overcomplete basis, there is a chance that this recoherence or reunification happens again. And so, some sort of intros introspection emerges. Thanks very much. So I'd like to welcome my next guest to Consciousness Central. This is Anil Seth. Anil is a professor of neuroscience and co-director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness Science at the University of Sussex in the UK. Welcome, Anil. Thank you. Great. Thanks for coming. So first of all, perhaps um, I understand that your main area of interest is a, a computational approach to understanding brain science, brain function. Can you give me an outline of what that really means? It means several things. So fundamentally, I'm interested in, in the brain basis of consciousness, like many people at this conference. Uh, instead of just looking for whether this or that brain region might be the seat of consciousness or the NCC, the neural coral of consciousness, the approach that I'm taking in, in my group at Sussex is to take actually a more general theory of how brains do things and then use that theory to see what parts of that process uh, not only correlate with being conscious but can help us begin to account for the phenomenological properties of conscious experience. This is a, an approach sometimes called neurophenomenology. So we try to match um, descriptions of phenomenology to underlying computational mechanisms. Now the mechanism that I'm most interested in at the moment is called many things. Uh, one of the things it's called is predictive processing or, or the Bayesian brain idea. This has a long history in psychology and in philosophy and in, in related areas. And the basic idea is very simple. It's that sensory data is very noisy, it's very ambiguous, and it's, uh, in order to make sense of it, uh, the brain has to apply some prior knowledge or some prior expectations. Uh, and that's what Bayesian inference is all about. It's combining some sensory data or some data with some priors to get to the best guess. So the theory says that what we perceive is the brain's best guess of the causes of sensory input. And there's quite a lot of evidence for that has been accumulating over the years. But that works for pretty much everything the brain does. So what I'm interested in is what part of that process goes along with our, what we're actually conscious of rather than what the brain anyway does. Turning now more to the sort of clinical applic applications mm -hmm. of what you're doing, um, wh what area does your, um, your um, the Sackler Center, what is that looking at? So it's, we, we set up uh, about six years ago with the explicit remit to try to bring together uh, a neurobiological approach to consciousness with its applications in psychiatry and neurology as well to some extent. Uh, and there's a number of areas we work in. In the neurology side, we're very interested in major disorders of, of consciousness, so things like the vegetative state where people appear to lose consciousness entirely. And here we are developing mathematical measures uh, like other people are doing, um, like Marcello Massimini, like Giulio Tononi, uh, to try to dissociate wakefulness from awareness. That can 
enable us to better detect uh, consciousness after severe brain injury. And then in psychiatry, we're interested in the, the mechanisms of abnormal experiences. And, and uh, psychiatry has, has it's, a, it's an area of medicine that has not advanced as rapidly along with neuroscience as one might have liked. Most treatments in psychiatry, are, they suppress symptoms. They don't really get at mechanisms in the way that you know, taking a painkiller gets rid of pain. There are a number of populations that we, we are studying in the psychiatric domain. Again, I'll give you just one example, and this is, this is psychosis. Uh, so in early psychosis, people often experience various kinds of hallucination. And this is interesting from consciousness science perspective because, of course, they're having different kinds of experiences. Um, now, we can try to understand exactly how that comes about through this framework of the brain making its best guess of the causes of sensory inputs. And this work started really with, with Chris Frith and other people in UCL, and, and, and we're taking it in, in our own direction to look at uh, how we can understand hallucinations as uh, a disruption in how people incorporate new sensory data into making sense of, of what they see and how that specifically affects their objective ability to, to do visual perception and also their subjective or phenomenological ratings. And so we're finding some quite interesting things in studying these, these populations. And we also want to connect that to computational models as well, because now we have better idea computationally of how vision works. We can start to be quite specific about at what level of the visual hierarchy uh, processes might get disturbed in generating particular kinds of hallucinations. We're also looking at autism. Uh, that's a very prevalent phenomenon and, and our approach is again a little bit different. The classical approach in autism is to think about a theory of mind and the idea that people with autism uh, have difficulties in forming or using an intuitive theory of mind about you know, what other people are thinking or what their mental contents might be. And that's a very valid and interesting area of research. But there are also some other things going on in um, autism that, that are less studied. They, there are lots of issues with regulation of the body, with perception of the body, and with autonomic regulation of physiological state. And one of the things that, that I've been working on particularly at Sussex is applying this Bayesian framework to the body. So just as we make our best guess of what's out there in the world using this inference process, we have to do the same thing about the internal state of our own body. It's, it's remote from the brain too. We don't have direct access to it. And so we can un start to understand some of these interoceptive or bodily symptoms in psychiatry as disruptions of inference about bodily state. And that's also turning up some interesting things when we look at it in, in autism. Um, just as a last question, do you feel as if knowledge and, and techniques and everything are accelerating the process of understanding as time goes by, do you feel? It seems that way to me as if, uh, as you said, psychiatry kind of a little bit left behind, but neuroscience is racing ahead. And, uh, oh, it is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So do you feel uh, like it's as if we're really getting somewhere ex new quickly? I think so. I, agree. Con I mean, confession here, this is the first uh, TSC meeting I've been to, mm -hmm. but I've been to, for more than about 15 years now, these uh, ASSC meetings, yeah. which are more focused on, 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 on the, the science, on the neuroscience. Yeah. And I've been in the field overall for about 20 years. And, and yes, I really think there has, been, there has been progress. And what you tend to see, I think, is this sort of, this gradual translation of philosophical questions into empirical questions uh, that are still, there's still a valuable interaction with, with philosophy. But I think that's a good sign. That somebody once told me that you know, philosophers should always listen to the questions, but never to the answers that philosophers give. And it's a general sign of progress when you see this, this, this flow. Part of that is, is down to a new technology. So the more we can examine the brain, probe it and change it, we can ask new, more refined questions. Part of it is the development of, of new theories and models. Um, part of it, I think, and I, I love working in this field because I think you get some of the smartest and most interesting people in this field because consciousness is one of the most interesting challenges in science is always throwing up new things. So that also helps. 
and comparing what's going on now to 15 years ago, it's a resounding yes, we understand a lot more. There are, as you may have discovered at TSC, uh, just a quick observation close, but there, there, there are so many camps that sort of kind of interact and then bump heads a bit. And uh, we come across people who say, oh, no, there's a TSC, there are far too many scientists. There should be more philosophers. And then other people say, no, 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 no too much philosophy, waste of time, mm -hmm. science. It's great. You seem to embody the two of them together and bring them together. And from that, we seem to get make progress. So uh, that's great. Thank you very much, Anil. And thank you. Uh, good luck with everything. We'll see you again, hopefully, next time. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Anil Seth. <laughs>just about wraps it for part one of our special bonus edition of consciousness central be sure to check out part two for more from the science of consciousness 2016 here in tucson this is nick day 
Goodbye for now. Thank you.